we thank God uh, for the gospel. And that is that Jesus died, that he buried and he was rose and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And we thank God for that. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So we thank God for the gospel by which we are saved, my brothers and sisters. So we're going to go ahead and get into our studies tonight. Brothers and sisters, we'll get into our studies tonight. Scriptures we'll be, we'll be dealing with as we go through these weeks. Uh, Philippians 1, 29 through 30. For unto you is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Excuse me. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Paul said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warred, entangled himself with the affairs of his life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. In 2 Corinthians 4, 18, We'll be referencing these scriptures. Uh, Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. As we encounter sufferings in this life, we have the option of where to place our focus. We can place it on temporary, temporary versus eternal. Uh, focusing on eternal things being considered Considering the transformed, glorified body we receive at the rapture, a reunion with God and all those who have died in Christ without sin, without sin or sadness, and the rewards we receive from our service in the dispensation of grace, my brothers and sisters, reigning with Christ in the heavenly places. Um, most people use Christianity and the term Christian as a social construct that does not lead to life changes. In other words, transformation and spiritual maturity. That's why we have Christians who are simply comfortable with church attendance on Sunday uh, or whatever through the week, whatever day, a lower commitment to a uh, uh, consistent Bible study, rightly divided, in which in-depth study, learning, and growth takes place. They are, they are simply comfortable and they don't engage in studying in depths uh, God's word rightly divided. Now the term Christian believer I use even though they still regularly consult, uh, some of them use this term, I'm a believer, even though they regularly consult with their horoscopes and, uh, and feel compelled to reach out to palm readers, consult psychics, they read new age books for guidance, they believe a line on a, on a fortune cookie, they replace their Bibles with self-help books as solid life advice, and they spend more time talking to friends who are not mature listening and listening to television shows and, and watching television. In other words, they, they spend most of their time talking to those uh, who do not know Christ. And, uh, and as they talk many times, those folks, they don't even know if they're saved or not. They don't even know if they're justified to eternal life. Um, and, and, and they're not, they're not conducting themselves as, uh, mature saints in the body of Christ. So, um, uh, and they do more time talking to these people with a family or friends. Uh, and you never, and these folks would never know if they, if they're talking to, a, a, a saint that's been justified to eternal life. And that's a sad, that's a sad, uh, commentary, um, and watching television shows of which does not line up with God's truth, his word, the Bible. We can see why believers and saints are missing in action in the dispensation of grace. While millions of lost souls are sitting uh, in hell and on their way to eternal damnation, without Christ, ambassadors presenting the gospel of the grace of God to them. Now, 2 Timothy 4 and 3 says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And after, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The question becomes for the reader of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, why is it that there will be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine? And the answer is also found in verse 3. We let scripture... Uh, we let scripture speak. We come from scripture with scripture, my brother and sister, to get your understanding and to take us depths 
uh, taking it into the depths of what a scripture is saying. So you look at the other verses and you look at scripture, my brother and sister, when you're studying God's word. So right there in verse three, the apostle Paul laid it out. Why is it that there would be a time when they would not endure sound doctrine? And the answer is also found in verse three. But after their own lusts, so where is the foundation for man not enduring sound doctrine? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. This negative response to God's word began in the garden with Adam and Eve, and it was because of their own lust, as well as they saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise. These are all after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, my brothers and sisters. That's what those are after. So as we look and the pride of man is what many have continued to operate upon. And when he views God's holy word, he put his wisdom, his lust and his vain pride, pride at the forefront. Now you can be law. You can't be law to the work of the ministry and what God is doing in the dispensation of grace and trying to do God's will while engaging. Let me say this in organizations like worldly clubs and, and fraternities and many other organizations that have nothing to do with the message of grace and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. I know sometimes Paul say, I might become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Sometimes you can see saints, Facebook, social media, they posing with their, their Alpha Five, whatever better, whatever organizations, but they don't, they don't, they don't show, they don't showcase Jesus Christ crucified. They don't, they don't, they don't talk about the Lord and Savior, what he's doing in the dispensation of grace. You don't hear them talking about how they are out there trying to present the, the, uh, the gospel message to the lost, but we can, we can, we can take ourselves and, and we, can, we can hang out with these worldly organizations that have nothing to do with what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. They are man-made organizations and they belong to the world system. And it's another sure way Satan uses to take saints away from what God's word and what God is doing in the dispensation of grace today. You know how churches have what they believe on their websites? You can read it, what they believe. They'll let you know about why they believe right division and, and what they believe. You know, and I'm wondering if believers ever look at what these man-made organizations believe and what they are requiring of them as they join these worldly clubs and organizations and what they promote, they would not belong to them if they really read, as they say, the fine print and what they believe in. My brothers and sisters, it is the heart of the man that must submit unto the power of God and unfortunately unto the power of Satan. And it is all boiled down to whether the servant, soldier, the ambassador for Christ desire to give up of themselves for God and the Father as a living sacrifice or continue to live unto themselves and fulfill the lust of their flesh and the enticing things of the world caters to their own good pleasure and not the good pleasure of the Father. This is because as 1 John chapter 2 says, the love of the Father is not in him. A believer is called to say no to many things today. There are many things in this present evil world that Satan uses to tempt us to give, to give in, to indulge ourselves, to cease hold of life, as they say right now, and enjoy it now, and have your best life now, as some of these prosperity preachers tell you. You see, my brothers and sisters, God is speaking. And 1 John 2, 15 through 17 said, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. You see that, my brothers and sisters? It says the love of the father is not 
in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if not of the Father, is not, but it's of the world. And the world pass away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God by faith. But a Christian soldier has to say no when he is tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He must utilize the design doctrine the armor of God has provided to fight the good fight of faith and the wiles and the schemes of the devil. We have to say boldly, I won't do it. I won't do those things that lead to distraction, to disruption, and to a, to a saint walking around functionally dead. That's what happens if you give in. What can a believer say at the judgment seat of Christ? Hey, Lord, I was in a motorcycle club. I was in this club. I was in that club. I was in a fraternity, and I dedicated my service to this. It's all going to burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. So what's the need for it? It has nothing to do with what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. Oh, I might become your enemy because I tell you the truth. This is how many saints and believers would not endure sound doctrine and turn their ears away from the truth. They have been deceived by the enemy that nothing is wrong with these man-made worldly organizations. My brothers and sisters, if it's not about presenting the gospel of the grace of God to a lost soul or presenting a message of grace in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, why are you involved? It's not about God. And what he's doing today in the dispensation of grace. Now look at Ephesians 6, what our apostle laid out, 10 through 13. Paul said, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. He said, wherefore unto you take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. How can a soldier fight the good fight of faith when he hasn't put on his armor? How can a soldier go to the battlefield without his proper equipment, his armor? Sad but true. Many believers in the body of Christ have not put on their armor. He says, put it's been provided, but many have chose not to pick it up and put it on. The arm of God is the living word of God, and it is designed to effectually work in our inner man if we believe it and walk in it. The word of God is the arm of God, and many and many armor is on. I'm going to tell you what the word of God is for many folks where it's sitting at. All right, here goes some truth again. You want some more truth. There are many of them, their armor on their shelves, collecting dust. My brother, sister, and some are in their trunks of their cars, wrapped up with all the junk that's in the trunk of the car. That's where some folks' Bibles are at, where they can pick it up on Wednesday or Sunday. For many, it's sitting on it's sitting only feet away. A few feet away from it, but they never get it, never pick it up and study it, right? To divide it. For many, it's waiting to be picked up off the shelf, or once it's found from the last place they can remember where they put it. Some folks don't even know where they put it, so they got to go looking for it. Where is the word of God at? Where did I put it at? Once they find it, they take it with them to their assembly and they open it just to hear a few feel good messages, and when done, back to the shelf until the next time they go to the assembly, until they go to the Bible study. You see, brothers and sisters, in verse 13, Ephesians 6, Paul says, Wherefore you take unto you the whole arm of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. What does he mean to stand? He was emphasizing that with God's help, in other words, God's grace, we will be able to hold the line to not retreat, to not give up and throw in the towel. But first, you got you to gotta go to the, to the battle lines. You got to go where the battle is going on at 
is going on right now. The phrase put on means to put on once and for all. This isn't like the game uniforms, you know, where you just put it on on Saturday when it's a game or whatever day of the week it is. And then when the game over with, you take it off. After the game, you put on the armor on once and leave it on for the rest of your life. You never lay your armor down. You put on your arm and you keep it on. And if you don't have it on, you become vulnerable at any point. The spiritual battle never cease. Look at what Paul says. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, we know we have the power of the Lord and his might. We put on the whole armor. We are ready, obedient with our armor, depending on divine power, and are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. As far as... As God is concerned, success in the Bible amounts to standing. And that is simply the issue of standing for the truth in face of any contrary doctrine and doing it whether we think it's worth it or not or whether we would do any good or whatever. Just standing is the issue with God and leaving the outcome of, of the stand to him. One planet, one water it, and God give the increase. Therefore, we successfully war a good warfare in God's eyes by just standing for the truth in the face of the adversary tactics, whether or not there is any positive response to our stand. Stand, therefore, is God's charge to us. This is what he values and esteem. This is what he has equipped us to do with the armor he has provided. And standing is well-pleasing to him, even when we are the only ones doing it. You stand. No matter what folks say about you, you stand. And what do we mean? Another word, verse we can use for you stand. In other words, you keep living godly in Christ Jesus. Because when you live godly in Christ Jesus, you sure are going to suffer persecution. You see, notice this in the charge Paul gave to Timothy. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, one to die also call, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. He said, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickened all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spite, un unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul charged to Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. He cites the example of the Lord's own good confession. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, Paul brings us up to impress Timothy's mind with something about the nature of Christ stand at that time. When our Lord stood before Pontius Pilate and he witnessed a good confession, he did so in the face of extremely intimidating circumstances, including the vile abuse of his person and the threat of death. Yet he stood for truth and witnessed a good confession but that is not all. The Lord also stood all along at that time. He stood for the truth all by himself, having been forsaken even by his closest disciples. For this reason, in particular, Paul cites this to Timothy and gives him this charge in sight of Christ Jesus, who knows all about what it is like to be standing alone for the truth. Timothy, therefore, needed to be encouraged by this and not discouraged if he finds himself all alone. And don't you be discouraged if you find yourself all alone because you tell the truth and you become others' enemies because you tell the truth and you stand boldly on the word of truth, right? The divided stand. My brothers and sisters, Timothy needed to Though popular thought would tend to make him think otherwise. Timothy needs to understand and appreciate that giving witness to a good confession as he fought the good fight of faith could be accomplished and often would be accomplished by standing for the truth all by himself. After you've done all, you just stand. When they done criticized you, talked about you, mistreated you, you stand. We too need to make sure that we understand and appreciate the same thing. Popular thought says otherwise, and the policy of evil is against us for us to employ the erroneous gauges for measuring success established by the human viewpoint, but to do so only breeds discouragement. 
especially when we find ourselves standing alone and making no apparent triumph for the truth. Always the believers to stand because Satan will attack him. You don't need to go find the devil if you're living God in Christ Jesus with the message of grace and the dispensation of grace and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You don't need to go find. He's going to find you because he don't want you preaching and teaching what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace. Second Timothy told us, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus. No man that wore it and tang himself with the furs of his life that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Paul shows us that a soldier's primary responsibility is to please the one who enlisted him in his service, in this service. He makes it very clear that our primary responsibility, our loyalty is to Jesus Christ, not a, co not a, not a cooperation, not a corporation, not a motorcycle club or any other organization, not a fraternity, not all these other clubs, the worldly club, man-made club, that is not about the gospel, the grace of God and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Christ is the one who enlisted us. He is the commander in chief, not man. He goes on to say that a soldier must be single-minded. If he's not single-minded and gets himself involved in things other than carrying out the commands of the Lord and the saving, the dispensation of grace, then that soldier's not going to be trustworthy. He's going to fall. He's going to throw in the towel. He's going to quit. He's going to give up. If he's not single-minded and gets himself involved in things other than carrying out the command of the Lord, of the saving, the dispensation of grace, the sa he's not going to be trustworthy. Let me say that. He's not going to be willing to endure hardship and to put up with the share of suffering. He will not endure if he's deeply entangled in things that is not of God and is not in line with what God's will for us in the dispensation of grace. Consider eternal things can shape our service towards God and others in the present even world, in this present even world. Paul, in discussing his sufferings, my brothers and sisters, as he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labor, more abundant, striped more in marriage and prison, more frequent in death off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice was I shipwrecked. And then he said, journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers. You see this? And remember, in hunger and thirst, my brothers and sisters, Paul says, if you understand right here, and remember, these were avoidable sufferings that he volunteered and endured. And you add to this the emotional relation of sufferings beside those things that are without, that would come unto us daily, the care of all the churches, he says. Do you understand? But what's even more impressive is his assessment of the situation. My brothers and sisters, if we take in light what Paul says about our afflictions, he said, for our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. My brothers and sisters, how can he call this monetary light afflictions? This is what I call a light headache, my brothers and sisters. This is what I call a light headache when you talk about these things that Paul is talking about. For those who can't grasp the depths of what Paul is saying, they would probably be saying that maybe one of those stones Paul encountered knocked something loose in his head when Paul talking about these light afflictions. Did you hear that? What the Bible is saying? Some folks probably said, Paul crazy. What's wrong with him? Weston got into him. What, what, what? This man lost his mind. 
That's what some would say, how Paul lost his mind. And that's what many would say tonight. After Paul endured all that he went through, my brothers and sisters, when he talked about that in 2 Timothy, I mean 2 Corinthians 4, and that those light afflictions 17 and 18, my brothers and sisters, we need to look at what Paul is saying here and, and understand the depths of what he's saying. And then Paul, when he talked about in 2 Corinthians 11, what he went through in pearls and all those things that I named in 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 about being beaten and everything he went through, my brothers and sisters. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.18. He said, why we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The key is what we focus on. If we focus on the things that are seen, our sufferings, they grow in weight and crush us. But if we focus on the things which are not seen, our sufferings will shrink in weight so that we are able to live victoriously in the midst of them. What are these unseen things? They are the great promises revealed by God's word for us saints in the dispensation of grace. You cannot avoid suffering in this life, but you can live victorious in the midst of terrible suffering if you develop a focus on eternal things. But most of us Christians live as though this world is where we are rewarded and happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment, and prosperity not only can be ours here and now, but should be. And most have set up camp in this present evil world. Most of the regrets of our lives come from failing to embrace eternity as a consuming motivational reality and failing to align our lives to the values of God's eternal kingdom. This is a huge problem. If we're going to develop a focus on eternal things, we must first know what they are. That's why Paul immediately follows uh, 2 Corinthians 4.18 by introducing us to three key eternal things. A transformed body. You read 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, for we know that if our earthly house this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He said, for this we groan, earnest desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Paul says, notice, the, notice what Paul says also. He said, if so be that being clothed, we should not be found naked. For we that are in the tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Those who have been justified to eternal life by believing that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day, according to the script, you will receive a transformed, glorified body when he returns in the air. Notice the contrast Paul draws between our present bodies and the bodies we will receive at the rapture. The earthly tent torn down. In other words, that's the one that's, that's, that's perishing day by day. Emphasizes temporarily. It's fragile, my brothers and sisters. But the building from God is eternal in the heavens. Emphasize strength and permanence. In an earlier letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. Paul elaborated on the the superiority of the transformed, glorified body over our present body. Perishable, perishable versus imperishable. Dishonorable versus glorious. Weak versus powerful. Natural versus spiritual. In short, our bodies will be transformed in the same way that Jesus' body was transformed when God raised him from the dead. Notice the tense of the verse in 14, 2 Corinthians. My brothers, 14, 4, 8, uh, 12, I mean, 2 Corinthians 4, 14, 8, because Jesus was resurrected 
You will be resurrected if you belong to him. When you read the apostle eyewitness description of Jesus' resurrected body, you are reading an advanced description of your own bodily destiny if you belong to Christ. If you've been taken out of Adam and put in Christ. Bodily, bodily resurrection doesn't belong only to the future. It has already happened if you know God's word. The word of God can point back to Jesus being raised from the bed, dead. No matter what happens in his life, God has promised us something so wonderful in heaven. A glorified body just like our Savior. <clears throat> it won't get sick. It won't, it won't die. A body that would never hurt or grow tired and sickly. A body eternal in the heavens. As, as Philippians 3, 20 through 20 and 21 says, tell us, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Say goodbye to sickness. Say goodbye to the hurt and pain. You can say goodbye because you got a glorified body, my brothers and sisters, according to the work whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. Don't worry about diabetes. Don't worry about congestive heart failure. Don't worry about dementia. You don't have to worry about none of that. You got a glorified body coming. You already got it because you're in Christ. And that would be the day of the rapture when our physical bodies are redeemed, my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> you already have it. My brothers and sisters, then we got a homecoming, which we won't get to this week. And then we got an evaluation coming. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ. So we got a couple more things we're going to be dealing with. But that's where we're going to end at tonight. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word tonight. We pray, Father, as those who listen in, we pray they were edified, they were encouraged, and they were enlightened. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.